started streaming. What's up, everyone? It's um, Sunday afternoon. Good afternoon. <laughs> this is a great question here today. Why boomers hate pop music? Before I get started, the um, discount code for today's live stream is RB808. Now, those of you that know about music production, you know what 808 means. Those of you that don't, we're going to talk about it a little bit. Billy, can you brighten up this light over here a little bit? Yeah. Thank you. Um, so, it, uh, <laughs> this is based on my video about the top 10 that I did where I was talking about the, uh, I went to the global top 10 from Spotify. And I listen to each song. I analyze the um, the melodies, the production, things like that. And I talked about uh, st structurally what was going on with each song. And of course, uh, you know, the video did, I, I don't mean of course it did well, hey Brett, uh, but the video got on trending to number 27 a few days ago. And, uh, and I think it's funny because I am a boomer, okay? I was born in 1962. The baby boom goes from, I don't know, 1945 until 1964, I believe, right? So, uh, but I don't think of myself in that way because I don't typically like uh, what boomers like necessarily. Well, that's not true. I like, I like stuff that I grew up with and I like contemporary music as well. So, um, I want to talk about these things. And I'm going to start out by reading some comments. Once again, um, the discount code today is RB808. That's for my new Beato book, um, Instagram, Quick Lessons. Those of you that follow me on Instagram at rickbeato1, I have a series called Quick Lessons, and I have 30 of them right now. And there's a book that goes with my Beato book, what we call the Slim Bundle, and it's 50% off that. And it's a really good deal if you've been waiting to get my uh, my Beato book, you can get that and this series of 30 lessons, which is about another uh, 50, 55 page uh, uh, book that goes along with it. Anyways, okay, first of all, let me read you the typical comment from this. Okay, here we go. Um, Pop sucks. <laughs> um, I think all that music is utter crap. I'm literally reading these just right in a row. Trap beat makes my ears bleed. Um, the Cardi track, slaps though that second song was unlistenable the only good songs are watermelon sugar and blinding lights others are straight up trash uh the next one the only cool part is when they ripped off red hot chili peppers um uh great video must be the chorus um let's see absolute garbage um <laughs> the top 10 tumors uh, Rick, you played the chord progressions alone on the guitar, the analysis of each song. It was better than the mixed final product by the artists. If I was scanning the radio dial for something to listen to and there wasn't a song in there, I would have it would have caught my attention to the point where I would have stopped. Okay, interesting. Uh, but uh, terrible, great review. Appreciate your honesty analogies. Ten reasons why I don't want Spotify. Um... Let's see. OK Boomer. There we go. Finally got one. It didn't take long to get to uh, to get to OK Boomer. Um, OK, but there's a really interesting comment here that I thought was more uh, that I actually I screenshot comments when I read through them and I save them in my photos. So there's one that came here like this. Person writes, if I could summarize my issues with contemporary pop in one sentence, too much production, not enough talent. The labels, if there are even labels anymore, have monetized it all the way down to a few algorithms and clever marketing. Now, this person says, I grew up on Steve Miller, Whitney Houston, Michael Jackson, Metallica, Prince. Of course, I could go on as people of a certain age know too well. Uh, the last singer I truly appreciate was Amy Winehouse. Um, anyways, Rick, I respect you can sift through the noise and find the good. So in summary, get off my lawn. <laughs> That's Now... This is really interesting. I put together a list. Actually, this isn't the interesting part, but this, that was very interesting, a very insightful, I thought. So I put together a list of what I think boomers, why I think boomers do not like pop, uh, popular music. Hey, Billy, can you brighten up this light a little bit more too? I look, I look, uh, I look kind of dark here. 
There we go. Better. Thank you. Um, okay, so here's the reasons that I think, and, I'll, and I'm going to give you some examples. Number one, no tempo variation. Every pop song that I played is the exact same tempo. The number one song right now, which is, uh, what, what is it, Billy? What's number one right now? It's not a lot. It's a no, it's, it's uh, oh. da, 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 yeah. mood. The song mood is all one tempo, okay? Now, I just took about two seconds and I programmed the. Now, I hope I don't get demonetized there. The whole song is 91 beats per minute. That is the basic beat there with pretty much the typical sounds that you hear. Okay, we'll talk about that in a second. My next thing, okay, so no tempo variation. For example, I did a video where I talked about James Brown funky drummer and it drifted. I have a an app for my phone called Live BPM. In old school songs, drift, they were done on tape, they were done with live players and they weren't done to a clip tip, uh, typically. Um, uh, Stevie Wonder, Superstition, all these records that, that I've done What Makes a Song Great on that are pre-1996 or so, for the most part, now th there's a lot of things in the 80s that were done to a click because they used MIDI, okay? But things that have uh, real players on them tended to not be to a click and they let the people just play free form, right? And they played live in the room and there are tempo variations. For example, if you take Back in Black by ACDC, I used that in one of my videos. So the verse was at 92. The chorus, uh, 91, 92, the chorus was at 94. Second verse was at 93. Second chorus was at 95, and so on and so forth. And yet they were fluctuating all the time, all right? So that's one thing that, w that people, I think boomers don't like, is that there are no tempo variations. These are subtle things, right? Um, repetitive sounds like I just played, those 808, 909, all those rolling drum machine, drum machine sounds. Like if you hear, you hear kick drums like that all the time. You know why? Because that's actually taken from one of the top 10 songs. It's not from the song that I put, but that, that clap sound you hear all the time. Snare sounds like that you hear all the time. You hear, this is uh, what a hi-hat um, they think sounds like. And then you hear the, the cicada rhythm a lot, right? That's what I call the cicada, the 32nd note or the hi-hat, quote unquote, hi-hat rolls. Those are very repetitive. Out of the top 10 songs, I had, uh, I think there were five that have that, those trap beat sounds that are just, um, that are used in pop music all the time. It's not just pop music, hip hop, rap, pop, Country music uses them. They're just, they've been around forever now. They've been used for the last, oh geez, I don't know, 10 years or so in pop music. And they're, they're, I thought that they were start, I think that they're actually on the decline. I really do because everything, eventually people get sick of hearing. Okay, so you'll start hearing less and less. And like I said, only about half, uh, half the songs use that trap beat sound that actually was big in Atlanta 20 years ago, okay? Um, next thing, all diatonic changes, meaning it doesn't change keys. Like the Harry Styles song, for example, right? Watermelon Sugar. It's just four chords. I mean, pretty much all of the songs on my list or in that list of the top 10, it's changed this week, but the, most of the songs are the same. Um, use four chords or less, and only one of them had a chord that was not in the key. Okay, one of them used the three major chord. Um, this week, 50 years ago, the number one song was um, Simon and Garfunkel, Bridge Over Troubled Water. Now, there are so many chord changes in that song. It's an incredibly sophisticated song, okay? It's a very melodic song, beautiful song. A song that you cannot put together with a drum machine and a piece of software. This is something you have to sit down and write, and I'm not judging things. I appreciate pop music because I'm a producer by trade and I love sounds, okay? And I love manipulation of sounds, things like that. But there's a lot of repetitive uh, things. These sounds. 
that you hear all the time. Swells, things like that, bass drops, all these kind of things. Just constantly. This is just what pop music is. It's a lot of these things. Next thing, um, beyond, beyond diatonic changes, meaning no key changes, and typically four chords or less. Uh, there's no dynamic variation except when people use sidechain compression. Sidechain compression is a thing that they use on, on bass. It's typically triggered by a rhythmic instrument, and it's, it has this sucking sound where it ducks. It's actually called ducking. It actually ducks the front end of a, uh, of a sound down, and it produces a pumping effect. And that pumping effect actually gives it rhythmic variation, but it's really uh, it's an amplitude uh, variation that doesn't really, uh, um, it does create dynamics, but for the most part, you hear those hi-hats, for example, right? I just played you that beat from the song Mood, and the hi-hat sound, it's the same, really, what a lot of boomers think is irritating sound that has no dynamics. Now, that's not even a hi-hat, it's just a tick from a drum machine that, you know, these drum machines were put out back in the 80s. A lot of these rolling drum sounds, and people have modified the sounds, obviously. You know, you can pitch them up, pitch them down, truncate them a little bit. But they're pretty much just sounds from 40 years ago, whatever, right? Or 35 years ago, whatever. Uh, the Trap Beats in the top 10, so 24K Golden, WAP had it, Lemonade, Rockstar, Laugh Now, Cry Later, the Drake song. Those all had the trap beats with those typical types of sounds. Um, uh, now, somebody says, oh, uh, a sidechain compression. That's typically used in EDM music, and that's an old school kind of thing. Uh, th when I talk about pop music, I'm talking about music of the last 10 years or so, because boomers really do not like uh, popular music for the most part of the last 10 years. This is when I started to see these kind of, uh, I've been seeing these kind of comments more and more on my channel. I've had my channel for four years now, but but as I started doing pop, uh, you know, including contemporary music, um, you started to see these kind of things, right? Um, I did a video on the Jonas Brothers, um, where the this musicologist was comparing it to Funky Drummer the uh, Jonas Brothers song Sucker, talking about the drum beat. And my thing was that it was a quantized beat, meaning it's all been lined up to a grid and people know, they're like, oh, Rick's talking about that again. Well, these are the reasons why people do not like these. This is another reason that boomers don't like it. They, now, they don't know these things typically, unless you're a musician and you can articulate these, okay? Um, uh, little sonic variation, uh, they have singable melodies, a lot of popular music. Some doesn't even have sing single melodies. It's it's uh, will have rapping, things like that. But the typical melodies, since the harmonic progressions are simple, the melodies are simple and they're very nursery rhyme like. Okay. Um, this is why what makes them catchy. Now there are plenty of songs that are not like that, but um, if you have songs that change keys, you get far more interesting melodies. I did a video on Sting. Now this is a Here We Go Boomer, uh, but this goes back to the 80s. He had a record called Dream of the Blue Turtles. It was his first solo record after The Police. And I talked about this song, Fortress Around Your Heart, which is very sophisticated. It starts in G Dorian, then it, it goes down to E flat, Mixolydian. Well, it goes from G minor to E flat, major to F sharp minor, and then the chorus starts on E minor, right? So it's modulating all over the place. So you get a really sophisticated melody. You just do because of that, right? Or, you know, grunge music. Pretty much all the grunge bands had very sophisticated chord changes. That's just a fact, okay, compared to today's pop music. So, uh, and then the last thing that people do not like typically people that are my age or, or, or even way younger than me is auto-tune, the robotic sound, right? That's what you hear where you started hearing Cher on Do You Believe in Life After Love, you know, back in 1998, uh, which has become just part of popular music. It's in every song, but there's just, there's two things. You have auto-tune and there's a thing called Melodyne. Melodyne is something that you use 
uh, that people use to tune vocals also. They, will, they tune vocals with that when you do not want people to hear the tuning because um, typically auto-tune is used as an effect in popular music, right? It almost doesn't sound like pop if it doesn't have auto-tune on it. It's just become the sound of pop music. Just like the uh, one, four, five, and six chord progression became the sound of pop music over the last 20 years or so. And you've seen the videos on there, on that thing. I've done a video on it, you know, the four chords of pop music, right? So auto-tune has become one of those signature things that, uh, that people just expect to hear. And they expect to hear in tune or perfectly tuned vocals, right? The, the pitch variation, along with the tempo variation, along with the, um, uh, you know, songs that change keys so that you have much more complex melodies is what to them made music more interesting. And I understand that, okay? To, to you know, the, the pop music that I played on my video the other day I enjoy sonically. I enjoy the uh, I enjoy the craft of how the songs are put together, how they put sounds together. Because most production nowadays is, uses what I would call additive sounds. I have a one of the tracks from the um, from the top ten. I have the tracks for okay, and there's 170 tracks. Now, one some of the tracks have just one kick drum sound on it for the whole song, right? or might have uh, you know one sound effect, swell sound effect, but they're all on separate tracks. If you have a song, you know, um, uh, it smells like Teen Spirit, okay? In the verses, the band drops down, Kurt Cobain plays a two note thing with chorus, down, down, right? And do, 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 right? They do the four chord thing and then, um, and they drop down. So they come down in dynamics. When the chorus hits, they play louder. Kurt hits a distortion. They add a bunch of guitars in there. And it's it's a very dynamic change. Okay. Um, Stevie Wonder, Superstition, when I did that video. There's like six cla clav parts in it, right? The drums are played. There is no click track because Stevie played the drums first on it, right? And he's just playing to himself. The keyboard bass sound, and I mean, it's just unbelievable how much variation there is on it because it's played, right? It's not programmed. It's physically played along to the track. And it's not perfect. None of those things are perfect. You heard the, the term, perfection is the enemy of the good, right? And, uh, the, you know, we are in the era of perfection now. Everything is, not everything, country music has a lot of variation, certain types of country music, Jason Isbell, people like that, Chris Stapleton. You'll find a certain style of country music that is um, that is very fresh in that way, that is actually played by players. There are certain indie bands that, that are played by players, plenty of indie bands that, that are not on the grid and things like that. Um, but the... Um, the sophistication in music and of, of melodic songs of the 60s, if I did a comparison between the 60s and today, so we're talking 50 years ago, or almost 60, almost 60 years ago, um, the mid-60s, there was an incredible music sophistication that started in the mid-60s from the chord progressions and the melodies. And it was across multiple genres of music. It was in um, Motown music. It was in pop music. It was in acoustic folk music like Jim Croce and uh, people like that that had really sophisticated chord progressions. It was in Led Zeppelin. It was in Black Sabbath, The Who. Um, you know, so many different styles of music. Uh, and I think that that um, that these reasons, there, there's, there's a nostalgia that people have because of when they grew up and they relate songs to that certain era. There's no getting by that, right? But there are concrete reasons that that boomers or that a lot of people, it's not just boomers, a lot of people don't like popular music. Um, but I think that they can't really articulate them. And so I just articulated those things. 
that, that uh, I think are the reasons why people don't like it. It's not necessarily the reason that I don't like it, right? Because I like songs that, like I said, I like production. There were songs in there that I liked that are in the, that are in the top 10. No tempo variation, repetitive sounds, all diatonic or chords from the same key, no dynamic or little dynamic variation. They use additive uh, uh, production values. So if they want a sound to get louder, instead of playing it louder in a performance, like a drummer getting louder in a part, they just add more things. They add it to make it fuller and louder. Okay, so that's what I call additive production. A uh, little dynamic variation, little sonic variation, although I think it's actually a, a lot of sonic variation. Um, but using a lot of the same sounds drum-wise is where they, the son, lack of sonic variation is, using the same kind of sounds like I was playing. I mean, the old cicada right there. That is taken from a, this is taken from a, con, a current song, those sounds. I just, <laughs> just literally got them out of there. All right, so there you go. It's not, uh, those of you that want to sample this, although it's not, uh, it's not hi-fi or anything, but those are, uh, those are kick and snare samples from a contemporary song. Um, okay, let me just say right now, before I, uh, uh, I'm, I see some questions here, um, discount code, this is how I make a living for my channel. Um, everything, um, my, I have my Beato book, in, um, Instagram, Quick Lessons, new, what I call the Slim Bundle, is on sale, 50% off, RB808, 808, it's 808 Drum Machine, that's what that's for. Uh, and then 30% off my ear training uh, course. And my ear training course, a lot of people made the comment on this that, wow, I can't believe that Rick can figure out those, so those songs by ear so quickly. Well, one of the reasons is that I developed my ear training course is for this exact thing. So you can hear a song and you can figure out what it is instantly. How? You listen to the intervals of the bass, you listen to the chord quality, whether it's major, minor, uh, you know, and that's it. This is how you do these things. And then you use relative pitch to relate it to whatever tone that you give yourself. If you play a C on the piano, you can learn to, okay, if it's C and then you hear it up a minor third, it's the note E it starts on. Oh, I know it's an E minor chord. So you hear E minor. Then you hear a chord that's a minor third up and it's major, a G major, right? So this is really how it's done. It's actually done through uh, using relative pitch, right? I don't have perfect pitch. I just listen to them and I can figure out what the chord progressions are. That's what my ear training course does. Um, so it is instructive. Oh, um, so 30% off for that RB808. It's the same uh, discount code. But it's instructive to go and look at the comments. I really think it is. It's, it's fascinating to me. I learn a lot. Uh, and there's a really wide range of people that watch my channel. Um, the, the, the biggest age group is 25 to 34, but it's only by a couple percent, like 23%. It's pretty even, honestly, from 18 to 55. It's like 20% each with some, you know, less on the margins. Very, you know, 13 to 17, no. My kids don't even watch my uh, watch my channel. Okay, let me let me answer a couple of these questions. Um, uh, Tony asks here, uh, what records I would recommend to help develop the ear for his two-year-old. Um, any type of high information music, Tony, Bach, anything that modulates a lot, a lot of jazz, contemporary jazz, or jazz, honestly, from the, from the, 1945 on, from Charlie Parker on, has sophisticated uh, chord progressions to change key all the time. That's my answer to that. Thank you, Jay. Appreciate that. I just missed where all my live chat stuff are. If I, I know there were more. Thank you to all the super uh, super chatters here. I don't know where, where they are, but um, but I really appreciate that. Um, let's see here. Uh, so I got a lot of great ideas from doing this video, though, that um, uh, that I think that, uh, you know, people want me to do more of these videos. But I'm going to do one on country music, I think. I want to do uh, do one on uh, indie, indie music, the indie charts, too. There's just a lot of really cool stuff out there. Um, I'm getting close to um, number 100 on my What Makes the Sun Great. 
people have been putting um, suggestions for that. I am taking suggestions. I'll take suggestions in the comments section here after. Thank you, Tony. Um, I will take suggestions for that. I don't have it decided what I'm going to do for number 100, but I want it to be a, a you know something cool. If you haven't checked out my latest one on The Who, you should definitely check that out because it's on Love, Rain Over Me, which is one of my favorite songs of all times. It's an incredibly great song. Uh, but, you know, I think it's good for people to get out there and listen to what is what people, what kids are listening to. My kids are 13, 11, and 7. Okay, they're not even. My son Dylan is kind of just into that area where he'd be getting into these songs right now, into popular music. So I'm two generations older than my kids. So, uh, and I work with contemporary music and have for years. Um, so there you go. Any other questions? Um, this, this is great. I'm gonna put out another video about this. I have an interview with Steve Jordan coming out this week, who's the great session drummer, played with John Mayer, great producer produced so many great records and um and uh so i've got that coming out follow me on instagram at rick beato one check out my quick lessons pdf it's actually for sale by itself too on my website i think but you can get the beato book bundle and my quick lessons uh bundled together the slim bundle as we're calling it um for 50 percent off today rb808 and honestly, if you guys own my book or something, you want to support the channel, I have t-shirts, I've got mugs, I've got, uh, I got plenty of other things in my store, but that's how I support my family and am able to keep doing this. Peter, now that's a clickbait title. There you go. Greetings back to Russia. Thank you, Peter. Appreciate that. I like it. But that's actually what the topic was. It was literally why people don't like, <laughs> why boomers hate pop music. I explained it, I think. Thank you, Stuart. All right. You guys are the best. Thank you so much. Have a great rest of the day. Take care.